أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. So today I want to make a video about a topic that's really close to my heart, which is sexual socialism in Islam. Basically, the difference between the kuffar or jahiliya and Islam when it comes to sexual relationships is the basic, basic difference before everything else, the fundamental difference between Islamic sociology and the sociology or the social structure of the jahiliya Arabs is that in an Islamic society, there's the, there's the virtue of haya. And what haya means is you have a sense of humility, but it also means you have a sense of shame around sexuality. You have a certain inhibition, right? You have a certain shyness toward the opposite gender. And it's the society as a whole acknowledges the need for sexual fulfillment or sexual companionship acknowledges the need that this need is strongest when it's when the person is youngest right and having acknowledged that the society facilitates sexual companionship for the individual whereas in a jahiliya society every individual is responsible for going out and competing in the sexual marketplace and finding sexual interactions fulfilling their own drives and then establishing their own relationship right so these are the two polar opposite attitudes towards sexuality and sexual fulfillment and the manner of sexual fulfillment in jahiliya and in islam the only ayat of the quran that mentions nikah is in order to facilitate the nikah of other people. Ankihu ul ayyam, ankihu ul ayyama minkum wa salihina min abadikum wa amaikum wa ankum ul fukara'a yughnihim hum min fadlihi yughnihum allahu min fadlihi wa allahu wa siyun alim. Right? Marry those from amongst you who are single, from amongst your male slaves and your female slaves. If they are a fakir, fakir is extreme poverty, poverty, it's extreme need. If they're extremely needy, Allah will enrich them, Allah will make them independent from His own grace, from His own bounty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is vast and knowing, right? So Islam is very clear that we're supposed to have uh, a socialist attitude toward facilitating marriage for each other and facilitating sexual partnership for each other. Amongst the Sahaba, there was never delay in getting someone married and there was never any condition for getting people married. You're of age, you need to get married and then you start your life. If you have Iman and you have the corresponding Akhlaq, you're not perfect but you have corresponding Akhlaq with Iman, you're supposed to be in a pair and you're supposed to start life that way from 14 to about 28 you're still developing there's the development of childhood and post sexual maturity there's another 10 or 14 years of development that happens that's supposed to happen in a sexual pair if you do not spend that time that development from 14 to 28 in a sexual pair what happens is you develop a narcissistic mindset. You dis you develop narcissistic psychology because your uh, brain is not uh, developed uh, or wired correctly. You're not wired or developed to be in a sexual relationship with the opposite gender, to enjoy the dynamics of that, the flirtation, the love, the affection, the mutual caring, you know, looking out for each other, being on a team, functioning as a pair rather than as an individual if you don't get wired that way which is the fitra which is what Allah intended for us to be 
then if you get married later than that or beyond that, you no longer have the adaptability no matter no matter what you, you just cannot possibly you don't have the neuro adaptability you don't have the neuro flexibility and you don't have the hormonal capacity it just not you don't have the ability to readapt your nervous system you know so it is a deep cruelty it's a cruelty and an injustice to purposefully prevent Muslims for not, not getting married and not at the proper age, meaning 14, meaning 13, whenever you hit puberty, that's the proper age. Allah knows better what the proper age is than society. If you prevent people from getting married, you prevent them from doing muta, and you prevent them uh, from doing zina, that impulse, life itself, genetic replication is life itself, will find some perverted outlet to express itself. There's no other way. In every single chromosome, in every single cell of our body, we are genetic replication machines. That's what this body is, these five fingers, this face, this beard, these eyes, that's what we are. Like this animal that we're inhabiting is a genetic replication machine. Now in fiqh, there's this asul that if there is an opinion about something that came up in the time, in the earlier times, and generations of scholars have affirmed that opinion, and you come to a time and someone has a new opinion, usually it should be rejected if generations of scholars have said something. But if there's new understanding, new evidence, new information available, then that, that sheds light in a way that is very uh, compelling, then it is possible to re-examine those opinions. So in the case of muta, right? And muta has broader applications to understanding the f social philosophy of the deen. But let's start with the particular issue. Muta, if we look at this issue, first off in the fact that kabair of the Sahaba, Sayyidina Ali, kabair of the fuqaha of the Sahaba, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, and others amongst the companions of Sayyidina Ali continue to practice muta for generations after the Khilafah of Hazrat Umar anhu. So this is a Khilaf. It is most definitely a Khilaf. There is no ijma on the mamla of muta. When Sayyidina Ali and Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Rehber of the Ummah, are not agreed on a position, then there is no ijma on that position. So muta, what it what it is is an acknowledgement that sexual fulfillment is a requirement. It is needed. It is necessary. That there's a limit of time. There's a limit of time that a sexually mature human being can go without having intercourse with the opposite gender. And that this is a need, like eating is a need. It is a zarurat. It isn't a luxury. It isn't a desire. It is a zarurat. And because it is a zarurat, if the committed partnership of, of normal nikah, the azwaj, is not present for whatever reason, obviously anywhere on earth you're going to have someone of the opposite gender present probably someone you find fairly attractive especially if you're men because it's easier to feel attraction then in that case when there's your normal azvaj is in present and you have a need and that duration of time that a human being can go without type, that type of intimacy is being pushed or has been reached or it's getting close then you should do muta. 
You should do muta. Because it fulfills your need. Now is doing muta supposed to be the standard and continuous practice throughout the Muslim world? Should we all just stay single and just do muta with whoever we want all the time? Of course not. That, that's not, Allah likes nikah, Allah wants nikah, Allah wants people to be in relationship. But what muta is, is an acknowledgement in the deen that sex is a zarurat, it is not a luxury. It's not just a desire, it's a need. Like eating is a need. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us permission to eat khanzir when we don't have halal food and we're starving to death. Muta isn't eating khanzir. Uh, muta is like eating, it's like eating the food of the Jews. You know, it's something that is halal. It's not something that's supposed to be done as the preferable thing. But when it's done, it's perfectly halal and good. And doing it because it prevents zina is rewarding. It's, it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards. So what I'm asking, so, so that's why when we understand muta that way, that it is something that should be happening in certain circumstances as an acknowledgement of sex as a zarurat this helps us understand the broader Islamic sociology which is that because sex is a need just like if there's poor Muslims right? if there's poor Muslims in a community it's the moral responsibility of the other Muslims to make sure that they have enough to eat, to make sure that they have shelter, to make sure that they're cared for, that people take care of them, that people don't disrespect them. If they're surrounded by non-Muslims, you know, the rich person, the rich Muslim is going to get treated differently than the poor Muslim, but the rich Muslim should take care of the poor Muslim. You should make sure that he's not mistreated also, if it's possible under the circumstances, right? And so, those type of uh, caring for each other type of situations includes if someone is single, they are poor. Rasulullah himself would pity a single man or a single woman. Because it is unnatural to be in this state, you are deprived. It's like being nutritionally deprived. You're deprived if you're single. You, you, you are biologically deprived. People who get married younger live longer. There's, and especially the time we live in, there's measurable consequences for purposefully delaying the life of others. And from a shari perspective, from the perspective of adala, justice, if you purposefully are preventing people to get married, then you're responsible in the dunya to not only to pick kafara but return what you've taken from them and we're living in a time where everything is measurable and everything is returnable for a cost right so we have to understand that like american parents or par muslim parents in america and muslim communities in america cannot expect their youth cannot expect sexually mature human beings to stay outside of sexual relationships for prolonged periods of time. We have to look at those Sahaba were only away from their wives for a few months, maybe a few weeks, maybe even a few days. And this was permitted for them probably closer to a few weeks. And muta was not, it wasn't something that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed it's something that he came and commanded the Sahaba to do. He's the one who communicated the concept and the idea to the Sahaba and told them to do it. Right? It's not something he allowed. It's not like they were eating a lizard and he saw them eat it and he didn't stop them. It's not like the Sahaba were doing muta and he didn't stop them. He came, Rasulullah came 
and told them to do it, right? And so this idea that is this of sexual social socialism in Islam, we really have to understand this idea that Islam, you know, just like socialism seeks or secular socialism seeks to take care of the needs of the population and countries like Denmark or somewhere in Scandinavia, they actually pay for handicapped people to go take the services of prostitute because they're acknowledging that sexual fulfillment is a zururat. But of course we're not saying that, but what we're saying is every person in society should be in a sexual pair and a sexual bond and that is not the individual person's responsibility to be go get in that bond. It's the societies, the collectives, the whole's responsibility to facilitate that. And there should not be condition upon the person if they're poor, if they don't have a house, they don't have a car, they take the bus. It doesn't matter. And in the Quran, it is clear that if there is poverty, if there is need, when the couple gets married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them ghani. That you're not allowed to pur purposefully delay the marriage of people. Anyways, I will talk to you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.